Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest podcast. And this is going to be on an exhibit that uh, Hannah Recht and I did a couple of years ago. And as part of that, we also, with Sarah, developed an app. But I'm going to try to focus on what we spoke about within this presentation. We always make the point that you need to look at axials and multiplanars, particularly sagittal view when it comes to the spine. People have written articles which very nicely make the point. If you don't look at the sagittal views routinely, you're going to miss fractures. You're going to miss osteoporosis. You're going to miss lots of pathology. So what we're going to do in this talk is look at the sagittal spine, particularly of the lumbar spine, and try to show you how many diagnoses you can make just by looking at those images. So the teaching points to establish the importance and accuracy of lumbar spine evaluation on abdominal CT, to propose a pattern-based approach to evaluate a variety of non-traumatic spinal pathology on CT. And so in this presentation, we're not looking at trauma, everything but trauma. And then we are presenting a range of quiz cases which you can look at. On this first part of the talk, I'm not going to do quiz cases. If you guys want, I'll come back and do a bunch of quiz cases. But after you finish this presentation, you can go to our app and you could take the quiz. Anyway, on CT, reviewing the lumbar spine is essential. You need to look at it on every study, whether it's pancreatitis or rule out lymphoma or rule out stone disease. You never know when you're going to find spinal pathology, and it may be the source of the patient's clinical symptoms. You need to review the sagittal reformats routinely. We have our technologists do it at the scanner. Probably most of you do the same thing. So it's not like going to the workstation and having to spend time looking at it. It's there already, and just taking a look at the spine is only going to take well under a minute. Obviously, MR has lots of advantages in looking at the spine, but CT is really terrific, and hey, you got those images for free when you're doing a CT scan of the abdomen or pelvis. Now, the way we thought about things was divided into six categories, and there perhaps are many ways you can think of things. We talk about the normal, low density, kind of like osteoporosis, high density, something like sclerosis, maybe a metastatic prostate or osteopetrosis. We talked about solitary lesions in the spine. We talked about aggressive lesions, which are not your simple uh, collapsed vertebral body due to osteopenia, but more likely a tumor. And then we spoke about lesions with soft tissue, such as an osteomyelitis or some aggressive tumor. When you think about a practical approach to the looking at the sagittal spine, think about the things you need to look at. Bone density vertebral body morphology, sometimes just, just shape. You know you're dealing with sickle cell disease or maybe thalassemia. Is it diffuse involvement or focal involvement? Is it L5 or is it L1 through L5? Is the lesion aggressive looking or is it benign looking? And again, is there soft tissue involvement? Now, of course, soft tissue involvement, as I mentioned, could be infection, means inflammatory, or it could be malignant, like myeloma or plasmacytoma. So in a sense, the different appearances will put you on the right path. Again, going back to something like bone density being increased, that could be benign things like osteopetrosis, or it could be metastatic prostate cancer. So high bone density, I think you're all familiar with what we're talking about. And if you look at this case that was showing you, it's involving both thoracic and lumbar spine as well as sacrum. And the things you think about, myeloproliferative disorders, renal osteodystrophy. And in fact, this was a case of renal osteodystrophy. You see the little scallopings at the end plates. You can see fluorosis, that's pretty rare. Lymphoma can give you sclerotic lesions, though usually not so diffuse. Systemic mastocytosis can be diffuse. Paget's disease will give high density, but usually limited vertebral bodies, and the vertebral bodies will also be expanded. Bomets, like prostate or breast, usually the entire body is involved, but it can be spickled. And usually it's not so symmetric as in this case of renal osteodystrophy and, of course, osteopetrosis. Osteopetrosis is really dense, 
deformed vertebral bodies, but a very, very unusual condition. So some of the pearls. In patients with chronic renal insufficiency, radiographs may show a diffuse increase in bone radio density, a finding that is more often in the axial skeleton, which has more trabecular bone than cortical bone. The etiology of this diffuse osteosclerosis is now well understood, although it probably reflects the anabolic effect of parathyroid hormone. Despite the increased radio density, the bone is structurally weak and prone to stress fractures. So very nice matching the case I showed you. Now, the next thing we'll talk about is diffuse osteoporosis. And that's a common thing, particularly in older patients, more common in women. When you see loss of bone, you can think of osteoporosis or osteomalacia. It could be hyperparathyroidism. Multiple myeloma is one of the things that gives you really washed out bone, but often with a destructive pattern. You could talk about metastasis or infiltrating tumors like leukemia. It can be drug-induced. It can be rickets, but again, clinical history will be different. Anemia, Cushing's disease, and systemic mastocytosis. So there's a very large differential diagnosis. In this case, you can see there's some osteophytes, there's some degenerative change, but very low bone density. The vertebral bodies pretty much maintain their height. This was diffuse osteoporosis, and a small pearl for that is osteoporosis results in substantial morbidity and mortality, primarily through fractures. Worldwide, one osteoporotic fracture occurs almost every three seconds, which results in nine million fractures each year. One-third of women older than 50 years and one-fifth of men older than 50 will have an osteoporotic fracture. The three most common fracture locations are the forearm, the hip, and the spine. Severe osteoporosis may prevent detection of non-displaced fractures, and CT and MR may be helpful for diagnosis if the patient has severe pain and a normal radiograph. A nice article by Chang. Okay, the third thing to look at. What are we talking about? deformity or abnormal vertebral body morphology. And in this case, we show a nice example with some scalloping of the vertebral bodies, particularly well seen in the sacrum. And that's something you commonly see with Marfans. Since there are multiple bodies, it's typically Marfans. Other things that can do it might be neurofibromatosis. If you think about a differential diagnosis, congenital causes would include a genesis, hypoplasia, heavy vertebrae, butterfly vertebrae, block vertebrae, and coronal cleft. And the acquired are abnormal size, okay, that might be Padgett's disease, let's say, border abnormalities, anterior, posterior, and lateral scalloping, neurofibromatosis, Marfan's, anterior border straightening, end plate deformities, vertebral tongues, spurs and beaks, and miscellaneous. So there's a range of things that can cause vertebral body morphology changes, and there's a range of appearances. And just to comment on uh, the posterior scalloping, which may occur as a rare variant, uh, in contrast to the concave defects seen with other disorders, posterior scalloping that represents a normal variant is characterized by an angular defect with this apex pointed anteriorly. Again, just to tell you that when I see scalloping posteriorly, I'm thinking about Marfan's and I'm thinking about something like neurofibromatosis uh, or any of those neural tumors. Okay, what about diffuse spinal involvement? Now, in some sense, on the first imaging, when I mentioned osteoporosis, in some sense, one can consider that diffuse spinal involvement as well. And you can see in this case of sickle cell disease, there's a range of processes that involve the vertebral bodies in their entirety. And of course, here you can see it's not just L-spine. If something's involving the entire L-spine, it's probably also involving the T-spine in its entirety. So we can think about metabolic abnormalities, renal failure, renal oxidative dystrophy. We can think about congenital processes like skeletal dysplasias, inborn errors of metabolism or storage disorders. Uh, think of something like osteopetrosis. We can think about hematologic abnormalities. Think leukemia or lymphoma. And of course, diffuse spinal metastasis, most commonly breast and prostate. And diffuse spinal involvement of pearl, we have found CT to be the most accurate method for evaluating the extent 
of osseous involvement and degree of cancellous and cortical bone loss. CT helps evaluate the risk for vertebral body collapse. Again, just a very nice description. Okay, now we spoke on the last series about diffuse. We think of the differential. Now, what if things are focal? If things are focal, the differential changes. Now, it may be focal like five different vertebral bodies in the entire spine, or three, or two, or one. One vertebral body, what are you thinking of? Infection, so you look at the disc space, you look for soft tissues. Infection can be bacterial or fungal or mycobacteria. Think about TB, you have spinal involvement and destruction, often with a discitis, often with a paraspinal mass. You can talk about metastasis, that's easy, including prostate and breast and neuroendocrine tumors. Myeloma, that gives you lucency or lytic component. Lymphoma, lytic or blastic. Primary bone tumors, benign or malignant. Think of something like a hemangioma as a good example for a benign lesion. You think about an osteosarcoma for a malignant lesion. And of course, inflammatory disease, which again comes back to infection. Think TB, think E. coli. And when you take the quiz, you're going to see some cases about that. Again, a comment. In many spinal bone tumors, MRI cannot provide characterization of the lesion due to poor detection of matrix mineralization. On the other hand, CT is useful for evaluating lesion location and detecting bone destruction and condensation. In particular, CT provides further information about growth rate of the lesion. For example, sharp circumscribed lysis, a sclerotic rim, calcification and ossification indicate a slow-growing lesion, whereas permanent bony destruction indicates a rapidly growing lesion. Okay, what else? Aggressive morphology. Well, you can see there's multiple vertebral bodies that are abnormal here and multiple disc spaces. Osteomyelitis, usually a disc space, usually two vertebral bodies involved, one superiorly, one inferiorly. Bacterial, fungal, syphilitic, TB, always got to think about. A primary bone tumor, metastasis, lymphoma, Langerhen cell histiocytosis or fibrous dysplasia are all possibilities that have an aggressive morphology. I think what's important about this chart is to make the point when something looks aggressive, it doesn't mean necessarily it's tumor. It could be aggressive and infection, or it could be aggressive and non-malignant like fibrous dysplasia. So just a really nice example. And here's just a comment. The early diagnosis of acute osteomyelitis is critical because prompt antibiotic therapy may prevent necrosis of bone. Osteomyelitis is primary a clinical diagnosis, although the clinical picture may be confusing, and an adequate or late diagnosis significantly diminishes the cure rate and increases the degree of complications and morbidity. For these reasons, imaging modalities are essential to confirm the presumed clinical diagnosis and to provide information regarding the excite, the exact site and the extent of the infectious process. So again, detection and management become critical. The last thing we'll comment on is soft tissue involvement. When I think of soft tissue involvement, I either think of infection or I think of tumor. So osteomyelitis, disc space involvement, paraspinal mass, TB is the classic, POTS disease. Metastasis, extend beyond the vertebral body, soft tissue mass, myeloma, expansion, or plasmacytoma, lymphoma infiltration, brown tumor, or fibrous dysplasia. Again, soft tissue involvement is common in malignancies, but can be benign tumors like neurofibromas, can be things like fibrous dysplasia. So again, it's something to think about. In this case, it was a plasmacytoma. So some comments about soft tissue involvement. The vertebral body is the most common site of involvement by plasmacytoma due to its rich red marrow content, but the tumor frequently extends to the pedicles. Plasma cytoma usually manifests, manifests with a single collapsed vertebrae. A monoclonal seric immunoglobulin is present at a low seric level in 40% of cases. So just a very nice point. So with that, I've covered our six points, and this is really a start for you. And what I want you to start thinking about is a systemic way of looking at the spine in every case. And I'm going to agree the most common diagnosis of the lumbar spine is normal. 
The second most common is osteophyte or other degenerative change. But many times you will find significant pathology that suggests other things going on in the patient and will help you. Now, to learn more about this, we wrote an article, Claire Brookmeyer, Hannah Recht, and myself, The Reformatted Sagittal Spine and Abdominal CT, A Structured Approach. You can read a lot more about it, an excellent article published in Emergency Radiology this past year. And as I mentioned, this talk was based on the work Hannah and Sarah did and myself on CT of the lumbar spine. You can go and download this for free from the Apple Store. It goes through all of the information I shared with you today, but also has a lot of cases for a quiz. So I think it's very exciting. And I hope you find it to be helpful. And it's for free. What more can you ask for? Anyway, have a great day. And I appreciate everybody's attention. Thanks a lot. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.